this is the sort of thing that really inspired me to take up cave diving so I could actually reach these sort of places. It's like a almost a, an adult lifetime of, uh, of what I've been doing has led to this very point. The tunnel was just like a jewel box in the front. There were straw stalactites that came right down from roof to floor. Scoff had said he found it an almost religious experience and it's true, you don't wanna you don't wanna shout, you just wanna whisper. So about 10 years ago, I was lucky enough to be part of a cave diving project at Boreham Cave in the Yorkshire Dales. As part of that project, I wanted to make a short film about the cave. So I took my camera underground and I captured some images underground and I also shot some interviews. But for various reasons, I never managed to put the thing together and actually get the film finished. It was only then recently that I was going through my PC and looking at some old video files that I realised and remembered that I still had all this stuff and I'd never actually released that film. Now, the underground footage isn't great, but actually I think some of the interviews have got some really good stuff in them, some really good material, and some of the characters telling those stories are really engaging. So I thought, why not put this together, why not get it out there, and why not get it released? And really, as part of this whole project, I think the early exploration of Borum is fantastic. It's a great story, and I think it should be told. And I think also this project for me is a great reminder of the importance of cave conservation and also maintaining access agreements with landowners. You know, and I think those two things go hand in hand to, to a certain extent. Um, we need to protect our uh, valuable underground resources and in order to do that, we need to work with landowners to ensure that access is granted on a sustainable basis. The earliest reference we can find is uh, a visit in 1751, Richard Pocock, successively Bishop of Meath and of Ossory. And he travelled from Dublin to England, and he visited uh, Old Court Farm and the uh, Grotto, which may be about 20 feet wide and 200 yards long. A winding way and having several pools of water in it and at last I came to deep water which hindered me from going any farther and I could not learn that anyone had been at the end of it. I went in first in 1956 right to the sump and we obviously realised then that uh, it wasn't going to uh, go anywhere till another way it could be found. Uh, then several members of the Craven started buying aqua lungs uh, and uh, Norman Brindle was the first to dive through the sump in June 1959. The passage underwater is approximately 8 to 10 feet wide and high and has a floor unusually of pebbles but of solid rock at one point. The water has a wonderful transparent green colour and is so clear that a normal cave-in headlamp is quite sufficient to see every detail and then at least on the way in with an exclamation mark. Uh, one bottle, uh, my suit was uh, bright orange from the Army and Navy stores, five pound, uh, yeah, <laughs> a lot of money. And uh, the uh, twin hoses, which were very handy for catching on projections and anything, uh, a knife cell for a light, a practice of holding the rope when you were going in, rather you had a guideline, you did a rope, what you took in, and uh, so if uh, you could pull on it if some, if you wanted pulling back. So it was a bit uh, basic to say the least. I think David's interview is a wonderful insight to what it was like cave diving back then and what those early pioneers had to go through. Uh, the story of Boreham Cave is also picked up in Martin Farr's The Darkness Beckons, so uh, I'll turn to some of that now. Martin writes in here that in 1973, Jeff Yeadon and Oliver Statham took up interest in the cave. Uh, Yeadon and Statham, of course, went on to become very accomplished cave divers, particularly notable for their world record breaking dives at Keld Head. But in 1973, they were new to the sport of cave diving and Boreham was a place for them to cut their teeth and develop their skills. Uh, Borum also has a connection to Martin himself. Uh, and Martin writes about his own experience of visiting Borum in 1974. 
Martin says, Early in 1974, Roger Solari and I visited the cave, completely unaware of any current activity by local divers. I added 15 meters of line to that already installed and emerged into what was clearly a major extension, which I explored for 300 meters before being forced to retreat by flood conditions. Later, we phoned round, discovered who had laid the line and informed them of our find. Our northern colleagues promptly continued the exploration. Although it was a perfectly innocent mistake, you can well imagine the annoyance of Eden and Statham when they found out what had happened and their find was snatched away from them. A few years later, Jeff Eden took part in a cave diving film that was made by Sid Peru, where he tells us the story of his next dive into the cave. Sid has very generously let me use a little bit of his footage and if you like some of this uh, material, I highly recommend you check out Sid Peru's YouTube channel. When I got to the furthest point, I found that the line continued. And it was a different colour. To begin with, I didn't believe it. But I followed on, and 50 feet further on, the line surfaced in airspace. And the stream was roaring down through boulders in front of me. Someone had obviously beaten me to it. He'd been pipped, all the more frustrating because the chamber he'd arrived in was so spectacular. Eden's state of mind can be imagined. Completely alone, with no one to share his feelings, he explored feverishly, determined to find, if he could, something overlooked by the mystery divers who'd beaten him to it. On the way back, I noticed a, a large tunnel high up in the roof and I decided that it was worth a try to try and climb the 40 feet from sheer face up into that tunnel. If I'd fallen, there would have been nobody to get me out. I would have just perished. And his perseverance and bravery were rewarded with a wonderful discovery. The tunnel was just like a jewel box in front. There were straw stalactites that came right down from roof to floor. I've got this memory of tinkling glass just being broken and then falling to the ground all around me. I felt like a bull in a china shop. About 300 feet further forward, things got even better as I approached the edge of a quite a large lake. So when I first started cave diving, I remember seeing images and photos from Borham Cave, or in particular from the China Shop, which is this incredible chamber uh, where the straw stalactites come right down to the surface of the water. But at the same time, I knew that access to Borham wasn't presently being granted. And so I gave up any ambitions of seeing this chamber for myself. Then, however, in 2010, a new scientific project was started at the cave. Part of Natural England's cave monitoring project, the idea was to visit the cave and take scientific readings in the cave, as well as use the opportunity to take some new photos and shoot some video in the cave. And this gave us a fantastic opportunity to go back to somewhere which, well, people hadn't really been visiting for around 30 years. I was having to collect uh, monitoring information for all the triple SI caves in the Dales. Uh, well, I didn't have to collect it, but I was coordinating the, uh, the caving clubs in their attempts to help us collect this uh, important information. And uh, Borum Cave was uh, listed as a, a separate triple SI and we'd had no information on it at all. It was the missing link for all the work that's been done in Skoska Cave and Stonelands Cave, Dalka Bottom Cave and Sleetsgill Cave. There's that small group of uh, caves in what I class Lower Littendale. One of my colleagues had been dealing with the, uh, the family at uh, Old Coke Farm and I asked him if he'd just raised the subject of uh, gaining access to Borham Cave to undertake uh, the uh, monitoring of the features of scientific interest in there. It was critical that we have access to Borham because it was the missing link. Eventually came up with a an agreement for three visits for the year in order to undertake this, uh, this scientific work. 
For my generation of cave divers, Boreham has, has become an almost mythical place. Nobody has, has been in Boreham Cave for 30 years or thereabouts. Andrew and David Hodgson, who's a, a scientist from Settle, had a, a real interest in the, the science of the place, but obviously they can't go in there. They, they can't actually get to see it. So what they needed were, was a kind of a bunch of people who, who had the skills to get in there, which fortunately is where, where I came in and, and some of my friends. Natural England can't contract people to work underground, but uh, cavers were allowed to submit information to us on part of their recreational caving trips. David obviously had this interest in, in the hydrology of the area, in the entomology of the area, uh, and we, that, that meant that in, in one go we could hopefully do all these things. Uh, fantastic opportunity. So UK cave diving. We always say that, that cave diving in the UK is it's potholing underwater. Uh, on the continent, in other parts of the world, it's basically diving, in a, diving underground. But in the UK it's very, very much, it's, it's rough, tough, gritty potholing, but there isn't any air there. So the equipment we're using, we're using side mounted cylinders because we need to get through very low sections where, where you could barely get through even without diving gear on. After the first sump, you've got some dry passage and then you've got a place called the slot, which uh, it, it caused people quite a lot of trouble even way back when. You read the dive reports from 30 odd years ago and people had difficulties getting through this very, very low area. Well, the first dive, obviously, you know, a couple of nights before that, I couldn't sleep. Because I'm thinking, Borum, we're going into Borum. And first of all, I, there was incredible excitement. After, after, I really couldn't wait. But also I was thinking, maybe this is a bit like meeting your heroes. You know, I've spent the whole of my cave diving career wanting to go into Borum. I thought, what if I go in there and it's not actually as good as I expected? Maybe Clive's photos make it look better than it really is. This all could be a huge disappointment. So, so there was real trepidation. There's also, it's, it's, it's not an insignificant dive. You know, technically it's, it's a reasonable challenge. Nobody had been in there for a long, long time, so we weren't sure what state the lines would be in. We didn't know if we'd even get through on that first trip. Boreham Cave, we've dived through five sumps to get to this point. This is the uh, famous uh, climb up to the even more famous uh, China Shop. So I'm um, gonna head up there, take some measurements and uh, photograph and video the China Shop. And how was that? Energetic. You certainly don't want to fall off that. It's a long way down, it's a long swim out. We're at the top of the, the climb, the rope climb up to the China Shop, which is a place that I thought I would never get to see. I've been caving and cave diving in this area for 20 years, and I always thought it was just something that I'd retire and I would never see. So, uh, anticipation is the word. So, it's the line? Yeah. Crouch down. Yeah. <laughs> please, please feel free to shout. So this is the China shop, a place I thought I'd never see. Uh, it's not a disappointment. Scofford said he found it an almost religious experience, and it's true. You don't want to, you don't want to shout. You just want to whisper. But it's, I don't know. It's incredible. Um, I first saw a photo of this before I even started caving properly, and it's sort of taken about 25 years to actually get here. Um, this is the sort of thing that really inspired me to take up cave diving, so I could actually reach these sort of places. And you know, whilst Clive Westlake's photo was fantastic, I think actually being here in person, sort of, um, it seems even more impressive. I, I'm a, a child of the digital age. Uh, the last time that people took photos in Boreham, they were using film cameras. Even black and white and colour uh, was almost not very popular by that point. It's like a almost a, an adult lifetimes of. Uh, of what I've been doing has led to this very point. I'm here now in the China shop. I've got the camera gear 
and hopefully it's not full of water and uh, the pressure's on a little bit because uh, you really, really want to do it justice. that the work that David's been doing has stretched back for uh, decades, uh, starting off with handwritten notes and then moving on to the, the data logging uh, and the electronic uh, logging of information. They've been in Skoska Cave now. Uh, in July this year, they were, have been in for six years. So with six years data, 11 loggers, uh, temperature every hour so we can tie things up with everything from my notes uh, and then to other things like that's a back count yeah that's September 2010 so that's showing what bat activity and that and so, this is the work that's now been extended to Borum so that's yeah. what yeah yeah making similar readings with it yeah that's the idea so we can try and do everything and tie everything in. To have that across a whole valley in the, or a whole dale is incredibly useful and uh, that's why he's in great demand from academics all over the, the country. It's without doubt the most beautiful cave in the Yorkshire Dales, probably in the UK, and it's, it's one of the most beautiful and unique caves in the world. So I think Borum is a great way to tell the story of the early pioneering work done by cave divers in the Yorkshire Dales. It's a great way to talk about the thrill and excitement of exploration. And of course, it's a fantastic way to think about the importance of cave conservation of these incredibly beautiful but incredibly fragile cave formations. I also think it's important to always remember the importance of great landowner relations so that trips and future access can be maintained on a sustainable footing.